Hello everybody and welcome to Commodity Culture where we break down the commodity space for both new and experienced investors. Before we get started, standard disclaimer, nothing here is investing advice, do your own due diligence. And today's guest is the author of the highly praised Doomberg Substack where he writes about energy, finance and the economy at large. Doomberg, it's great to have you back on the show. Jesse, great to be back. Hope you're doing well. I'm doing very well, thank you. And I want to start off with what appear to be some major cracks showing in the banking sector in the U.S. It appears to be chaos right now, at least if you're on Twitter today. Um, You know, Silicon Valley Bank was shut down by regulators. CNBC is calling it the biggest banking failure since the global financial crisis. We've also now seen the crypto-focused signature bank collapse. And uh, several bank stocks had to be halted today due to massive sell-offs. The Fed and the, and, and the Biden administration appear to be offering little confidence to, to investors and, and to people who are following the situation. There's speculation that this will finally cause the fabled Fed pivot or at least see them pausing rate hikes. I mean, what, what do you make of this whole situation? What do you think caused this? Is this something systemic? And do, do you think these could be the first dominoes to fall in what could be a larger contagion that could spread to other financial institutions? So I might surprise you with my answer, and I might come to regret it in the days ahead, but I I do think the worst is behind us. Um, Let me tell you sort of a clue how we watch the news. So we were watching this, of course, like everybody, well, not not everybody, but um, the people that live in the Twitterverse like we do. And um, yesterday, a strange headline hit, which was um, First Republic has access to the Fed window and stands ready to meet deposits with $60 billion of backstop or whatever it was. And we did not see that headline with Signature, which of course was the other bank that went into the weekend in significant trouble. And then we saw this amazing press release from the Fed, basically as an afterthought, oh yeah, uh, we've taken over Signature, the management has been fired, and um, that bank is basically canceled. <laughs> you know, the stock is canceled. And, um, and that informs us that the Fed made a decision we're going to ring fence in First Republic and we're gonna ring fence out Signature, um, Silvergate and Silicon Valley Bank sort of did it to itself, which is a whole other story. Um, we put out a tweet last night that, that, that had pretty high engagement, which said basically the Fed used the cover of Silicon Valley Bank's collapse to take out the last of the crypto rails, um, the major crypto rails in Signature. And, and the analogy we would use, it's just sort of like attacking the Nord Stream pipeline. You took out the Send Network, then you took out Signet, and uh, we put, rewrote a piece last week, you know, not, not necessarily predicting the particulars of the event, but certainly the intent. Um, the Fed is, is, out for, is out for the throats on crypto. They're, they're playing for keeps. And um, if you have anything tangentially to do with crypto as a business or in your personal banking, as we said in the piece last week, you know, um, Pandora's precedent, prepare for ejection from the U.S. banking system. And there will be innocent casualties, which is something to be lamented. Uh, we don't like it. It, it. It's not the way things should be. Um, but it is also something we predicted long ago from the very earliest days of Doomberg. Frankly, we're surprised it took this long. I think you will see that the Fed has decided it's going to ring fence this issue. And historically, maybe it's different this time. I've learned the hard way. Uh, betting against the Fed is a great way to turn a large fortune into a small one. And I think um, by hook or by crook, the banks that the Fed has selected in will be saved. Um, historically, when the Fed is forced to choose between the abyss and bending a few laws, they choose to bend a few laws. You know, we saw that when they started buying corporate debt during COVID. That was illegal. Who's bringing that up now? The Fed will do what it takes. Um, it is, of course, a symptom of a highly diseased corpse. Uh, but is this the one? Uh, I, I would say I would fade the mania that we saw on Twitter over the weekend. And it should be said, some of the behavior on Twitter was purely reprehensible. And uh, I suspect there will be some people held to account for their behavior. We all know who we're talking about and what they did. Um, so that that's our view. I would say um, with this new you know, four-letter bazooka, um, the Fed has decided who is going to survive, and the Fed has more power than even a Twitter mob. 
Right. Well, I want to follow up there on your comment about the U.S. government going after crypto. Um, We saw the SEC and Gary Gensler talk about how all of these cryptocurrencies are considered unregistered securities. Um, However, Bitcoin seems to be in somewhat of a different category, although now now you see the Biden administration saying they want to tax electricity that's used to mine Bitcoin. I don't know how they're going to figure out what electricity is used to mine Bitcoin and what's not. Um, So, you know, I don't really talk about crypto much on this show. I'm personally a Bitcoiner. I don't touch any of the other crypto. But in, in your opinion, do you think that that Bitcoin could be exempt from this attack due to its truly decentralized nature? Or will they find a way, as with this supposed tax on, on Bitcoin mining electricity, to go after Bitcoin as well? So uh, we're of two minds on that question, which is obviously something we've contemplated. And we would agree that you should separate Bitcoin from the rest of the digital currencies for no other reason other than the regulatory clarity exists. It is treated by the IRS as an asset. Um, It is legal to own, buy, and sell it. However, there is a chance, you know, if you're a bank executive watching what happens to Signature and Silvergate, and to a less extent, Silicon Valley, but let's not forget that's the bank that enabled a lot of the VCs who indulged in this crypto nonsense. Um, It's not a shock to me that all three of those banks are gone. I mean, the speed and, and so on is certainly shocking, but if you'd have told me that would be the end result, I wouldn't have been stunned. Um, There is danger that all banks will just walk away from all crypto and the nuanced differences between Bitcoin and crypto uh, won't matter to them because to to them, your juice isn't worth their squeeze. And and so there's one Bitcoin is one Bitcoin. You could cold store it and there might come a day where Bitcoin is the global currency and you'd be glad you bought and stored and maintained the keys for the Bitcoin that you own. But we could potentially be heading into sort of the um, the valley of death uh, for a few years here. And, and, uh, you know, to the true Bitcoin maxis, they don't care. They expect this. And and they're happy to see the crypto wash out. I'm happy to see the crypto wash out. I'm surprised it took this long. Um, Our good friend, Mark Ahotis, who who called a lot of this and and a famous short seller um, who's who's very active on Twitter. Um, I listened to him on a Twitter spaces last week. He said something pretty profound, which really caught my ear and which makes sense. It resonated. Um, all of these offshore crypto exchanges really bounced to the forefront after Wirecard collapsed. And, and in his view, the crypto mania was a money laundering fraud with a crypto wrapper. It wasn't a crypto fraud. And, um, and so we'll see where the money laundering activities go. It's very clear that, you know, Jerome Powell and you know, Secretary of Treasury Yellen um, and senior leaders in the administration have had enough. <clears throat> They're going to impose their will. They're going to protect the dollar. Um, and uh, as we said in um, Pandora's precedent, that we're not surprised that it happened. We're a little uncomfortable with some of the tactics. But if you poke the bear, you know, sometimes you get scraped. Very well said. Um, let's shift to commodities now. And I want to start with uranium because it seems like sentiment for nuclear power from governments around the world continues to trend in a very positive direction. We've seen a bipartisan effort in Illinois to repeal a nuclear construction ban advancing. And I just think that right now there aren't many sane people left in the world who, you know, don't realize how important nuclear is to achieving climate goals, net zero goals, etc. The U.S. has also started purchasing uranium into a new strategic uranium reserve. So what's your current view on nuclear and uranium as we sit here today? Is this all a foregone conclusion? Are we entering a great nuclear renaissance or, you know, barring a nuclear accident, of course, is there anything else you see out there that could maybe throw a wrench in things and and set us back on that front? I would say that we are um, hopeful and quite bullish on nuclear. And there's a few milestones we're looking for in 2023 to that regard. One is, you know, the Wall Street banks who kind of overextended themselves on ESG much to the chagrin of many of their wealthy, you know, um, fossil fuel industry type conservative um, leaders in the country. Um, there's a chance for them to thread the needle here and to step away from the Malthusian instincts of the radical environmentalists and say, we support nuclear, we support the financing of nuclear, nuclear is the answer. And um, we can all agree that uh, nuclear is carbon free. And if we're going to reorganize our economy around minimizing carbon emissions. The only way to do that without substantially reducing our standard of living 
is to have nuclear power at the center of your policy. And, and it wouldn't take much to slay the sort of um, the core of the radical environmentalist Malthusian movement because nobody would vote for that. Like if you put their actual agenda on the ballot, they would get wiped out. And I think an agenda of a you know, proactive replacement of coal with natural gas and a, and a nuclear power renaissance and you know, um, battery to, uh, batteries to reduce our, our gasoline use over time, um, that, that policy would pass because um, you can reduce your carbon emissions substantially um, uh, without really sacrificing people's standard of living. And the people calling for the sacrifice of the standard of living, of course, aren't sacrificing their own, which is why it would never you know, pass muster um, sort of, uh, in a democracy. And so I, I do think that the secular, there's a secular tailwind to nuclear and to uranium. How that manifests itself in particular trading opportunities is for each individual listener to decide for themselves. Um, but yeah, I, I do think the future is bright for nuclear. I think the momentum is on the side of the pro-nuclear movement. And I think when confronted with the consequences of getting it wrong, the seductive nature of the simple answer of how to get it right um, only becomes ever more powerful. Well, let's switch to natural gas, as you've touched on there. You also mentioned uh, a little bit at the top of the show what you referred to the Nord Stream, and I wanted to touch on that um, because one of the most respected investigative journalists, as you've discussed before, Seymour Hirsch, published a piece laying the blame squarely on the U.S., I believe in collaboration with Norway, correct me if I'm wrong there, and potentially some other people as well. Um, do you think Seymour's accusations actually present enough evidence to fully condemn the U.S. government in this matter? And should this fact be proven beyond a shadow of a doubt, do you think there'll actually be any serious consequences? You know, I'm, I'm reading a book by Noam Chomsky right now called Rogue States, which is like the modern history of what the U.S. and NATO has done and the amount of illegal acts that have led to atrocities that have never they've never been convicted for is massive. So I'm not too hopeful that they would actually be convicted or condemned in any way. But do you think that could be possible either through a court of law or through, you know, retribution by Russia or something like that? So that's a tough question, but let me try to tackle it in parts. So the title of our piece was called Let's See More. And in it, we highlighted the weakness of the article, which makes many profound accusations, which is it relies on one single anonymous source. Now, that is not necessarily in contradiction with journalistic standards. But if this had multiple sources on the record, we would all agree that it would have been a much more powerful piece. Having said that, the circumstantial evidence that surrounds it is pretty, that he goes through in the piece, in addition to the source, um, it, it is pretty compelling. Um, the consequences of what he reports, if it's true, are so profound that I would say it requires more, which is why we went with Let's See More, which is sort of a play on his last name. And um, thus far, his subsequent pieces have not really touched on it, which has been disappointing to us. Um, having said that, it's not just incumbent upon Seymour Hirsch to chase this down. I think the lack of curiosity amongst the sort of standard mainstream media is interesting. Um, as we said in the piece, if this, if, if, if what he said is true, I think it calls for Biden's impeachment. And if what he said is not true, if he got it wrong on the major details, then his reputation will be deservedly destroyed. Because you don't go, look, as we've grown and we've had more influence and get a larger Twitter following, you necessarily become more careful with what you write and what you say because your, your impact has, has, more, more of a, has more sway. You know, it has a wider, wider range of, of consequences. And, and necessarily, you have to become more certain of what you write. And if you get it wrong, you have to be the first to correct it and to admit it. Um, and so I would like to see more. Um, I, I suspect that many of the details may be wrong, but the underlying accusation probably feels right. But that's just speculation without any evidence. We've, we obviously don't have any sources in the intelligence community to rely on. And he's been doing this for 50 years. And it's very difficult for us to imagine that he would extend his entire career's reputation on this one piece and never follow up. So we're still waiting for the follow up. I would say that um, the time since he published that piece and now is, is over a month and I'd like to see more.
So natural gas futures in Europe jumped 25% in just a couple of days recently, and there's a number of potential reasons. I think they're continuing to climb um, today as well. Defects at two French nuclear reactors, um, there's strikes in that country that are affecting uh, operations at energy facilities, I believe LNG facilities, a late winter temperature drop that increased demand. Um, why do you think ultimately the prices rose? And does this show a fragility in the energy market in Europe, despite a lot of people calling the whole energy crisis off due to this one warm winter that we've had? All of this data only serves to demonstrate the following fact. Trading natural gas is known as the Wittermaker, Wittermaker trade for one reason. It is extraordinarily volatile, highly inelastic, and swings wildly. And why is that? Well, it's a gas, and it's difficult to store. It's difficult to move around. And so if you can't get rid of it, you'll pay someone to take it. And if you need it, you'd pay anything to get it. And so in the same calendar year, we have natural gas trading for roughly $2 per million BTU in the United States and $100 per million BTU in Europe, 50x arbitrage for the exact same molecule. And it's a simple molecule, CH4. And yet, because of its utility and the difficulty with which um, uh, transportation challenges you know, uh, raise their heads, it, it, it has this wild, wild swings. And, and so, you know, a 25 percent jump in European natural gas prices doesn't even make the radar anymore. Like that's that's the bid ass spread in a week. I mean, so um, you you are correct in that you know it's very easy to prepare for winter when it never comes. And Europe had an extraordinarily warm winter. We've documented this in a piece that we wrote at the end of the year um, called "The Whims of Gaia." And um, my, our fear is that the European establishment will draw all the wrong lessons from this narrow escape, which we're thrilled that they were able to escape. Like we, uh, as much as we were a warning of potential consequences, we certainly weren't hoping that they would happen to validate our warnings. Like we have said openly, even at the peak of the crisis, like we, we, we have many friends in Europe, many subscribers in Europe, and we would like Europe to get through the winter. They have. Um, good for them. Um, there's costs to the tactics that they use to get through the winter, which are conveniently minimized right now, but the, the more worrying concern is they draw all the wrong conclusions from this, and then we get an unseasonally cold winter next year, and we're right back where we started. And so, you know, to get through this winter, Germany and Western Europe bought every BTU of energy they could, regardless of price, regardless of carbon footprint, and regardless of the impact on the developing world. And they spent probably, what, a trillion dollars across the continent to do it. Um, if that's considered a victory, hey, maybe we want to consider the policies that put us in the position to have to do that in the first place. And you ask the quarter, quarter billion people in Pakistan whether this is a victory. Um, and so, you know, it is what it is. Um, I'm happy that they had a warm winter. Uh, I don't read all that much into this 25% um, spike because I didn't read all that much into the 80% drop from the highs. You know, it, it, um, natural gas is a widowmaker trade. It's very tough to trade as a commodity. Um, interestingly, the ratio of natural gas in Europe to the U.S. has stayed pretty constant. It's about you know six to nine. The whole the whole crisis, pretty fascinating. And so um, that's that's natural gas. Um, the volatility there is way higher than oil, which is you know in line with coal. Um, but natural gas is a real tough commodity to trade for sure. Yeah, that's great context there because there's always people stirring up drama on Twitter, as I think we were alluding to earlier, and uh, people saying, "Oh my God, a 25% jump! This is this is crazy." But so it's it's great to hear you put it into context there. Um, I want to switch over to gold and and ask you how important you think it is to have your hands on physical gold at this point in time. You know, you've mentioned that Silicon Valley Bank, that failure is largely contained and probably won't become a much bigger issue, at least maybe not anytime soon. But, you know, there's always, we, we've seen bail-ins happen in less developed countries, people being unable to access their funds. I mean, in my home country of Canada, certain people's bank accounts were frozen at one point in time. Um, so do you think gold is important to hold as a hedge against that sort of thing occurring, just a way to remove wealth from the financial system um, and perhaps prevent the threat of losing access to one's capital along with all of the other myriad of reasons to own it? So our philosophy is that we earn money in fiat and we transact in fiat and we are uh, you know, going to swim with the current and, and not be sort of um, 
proactively putting a huge amount of our wealth outside of the system. Um, but we do save by, so we, we earn in fiat, we save by buying real assets, including gold. And then we invest privately where we can affect the outcome. And the, the, that second category is where gold fits in. And um, we view gold as a excellent saving mechanism. So if I have 20 silver eagles, uh, sorry, 20 silver, um, yeah, 20 gold eagles in my hand, that's, you know, um, what, like 39 or $37,000 today. 20 gold eagles buys you roughly a midsize SUV. Today, in our view, in 20 years, 20 gold eagles will buy you a midsize SUV. And so I view gold as a savings vehicle, not an investing vehicle, not a vehicle for speculation. I do prefer physical, but when I want to allocate a lot for a, a period of time, I will invest in the Sprott Physical um, Gold Trust, FIS, as my preferred vehicle because I do believe it is backed one for one, and it's a vehicle that I trust much more than GLD. But um, in order of um, trust for me, it's, it's gold I can hold in my hands, better than FIS, better than GLD. Um, I would not invest in GLD just because, you know, with all the options and futures, like it, it's a vehicle for speculation. And, and um, I think sort of fractional reserve gold is the way that I would characterize it. Whereas, you know, um, when I hold a gold coin in my hand, if, if you, as I'm sure you have, there's a certain feeling that comes when you hold it in your hand and you know what it means and you know what the thousand years of pedigree of gold means. And, and so um, the gold that I own will someday hopefully end up in the hands of my children because I won't need it between now and then. But um, it's not like it's a huge part of our savings portfolio, but we certainly have, you know, single digit percent of our net worth in, in various precious metals and then land and other real assets that you might, um, that tend to do well as sort of hedges against hyperinflation. You know, a lot of people say, boy, gold hasn't performed as a hedge against quote inflation. Uh, gold is actually a hedge against hyperinflation. And if you lived in Turkey or you lived in Venezuela or you lived in Pakistan or Bangladesh or Sri Lanka and you could have bought gold in your local currency five years ago, that would have been an unbelievable trade. Um, and so in my view, if gold is, is um, you know, 5% wouldn't be a crazy allocation. Um, there's better returns on money if you're trying to grow your capital than gold, but to protect in a worst case scenario risk, some portion of your net. I like to characterize it as it raises the floor of my worst case scenario risk. Interesting. That's I like I that. It, yeah. Yeah. Um, I want to move on to copper in a second, but before we do that, I want to kind of jump back to the global economy and hone in on Japan and the Japanese economy because it seems to be in a pretty precarious situation right now with the Bank of Japan aggressively printing yen to buy government bonds while attempting to cap their 10-year JGB around 0%. Now, the retiring central governor, central bank governor, of course, is saying it's a great policy, defending the policy. Of course, no big surprise there. As we know, central bankers tend to um, talk their own book more often than not. So, my question is, is this ultimately a sinking ship? You know, again, we see gold bugs of people who are interested in sound money pointing to Japan saying this whole thing is going to collapse, their economy is going to collapse, hyperinflation is coming at any moment. Can the Japanese continue with endless QE or is there is there an end to this game anytime soon? So much like the opening question of, of our discussion, this is another example where um, everybody knows what has to happen eventually. And eventually it could take a really long time. And um, so the question is, you know, we wrote a piece back in September at sort of the apex of the crisis called Battle for the Yen. And, um, and we were like, you know, I'm not so sure. <laughs> it's, 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 um, there's a long line of people that have died on the hill of this is it for the Yen. And um, we'd probably need to see a lot more <laughs> before we would, we would say that this is it. You know, like again, it's Doomberg, you would think we would be on the other side of that, but um, much like with the banking crisis in the US, everybody knows structurally the US is insolvent. Um, I don't see people lining up at banks in my city as I drove into work today. And I'm not sure that this is quote, it for the end. I would say that there's one thing that sort of people of our ilk, because we're all sort of, I would characterize as defensive pessimists, uneasy with the but the fact that where we're going is purely identified and, and perhaps wondering whether the arrival date is, has been pulled forward. Um, the powers that be have a lot more tools, a lot more creativity, and a very high motivation 
to keep this giant global game of extend and pretend going for a lot longer. And so if you pushed me and said, is this it for the yen? I would say no. Um, and by the way, that's something I've had to learn the hard way. Um, betting on calamity, as we said earlier, when forced to choose between the abyss and bending the laws, central bank governors and their political overlords will bend every law possible. They will ride it all the way to the end. Now, when you're right, it will be a spectacular fall. I, I just hard pressed to see that this is the time where where the yen is, is is going to have that fall. Right. There seems to be a, a collapse just around the corner all the time. So I, I totally see your point there. Now, I, I want to shift to copper here because it's such a vital metal for electrification. And the long term supply of copper does seem to be in a pretty precarious position. I mean, we've seen we're seeing copper mines having issues around the world. There's a Chinese copper miner that was shut that shut down a mine in Peru due to protests. Copper mine was blocked from being started in Alaska by the Environmental Protection Agency. Another one in Panama had to suspend operations after being refused a permit to export. And more and more of these type of situations are occurring. I had uh, Johnny Kovacevic on my show recently. Um, he was the founder of Faraday Copper Copper Bank there. And he was saying there's almost nowhere left in the world where you're not going to have environmental sensitivities, political sensitivities, or AK-47 type security sensitivities when it comes to establishing, uh, developing, and opening a copper mine. So w what does this mean for the new green economy, seeing as the amount of copper needed to realize these carbon neutral goals is absolutely enormous? Yeah, so we wrote a piece in uh, January called Mission Impossible. And I have a sort of a photographic memory for the titles and social previews of all these pieces because I live and eat and sleep and dream and breathe all of them. But um, I, believe, I believe the social preview for that piece went something along the lines of Praying at the altar of the impossible is a foolhardy luxury of the rich. Um, we do not have enough battery metals to transition both the electricity grid, let alone the transportation sector, to the Green New Deal. And therefore, we won't. They just don't exist. And much like with natural gas, the price elasticity demand for these things, because the people that buy copper industrially need it. And, um, and they'll pay whatever the market clearing price is or they'll go to business. And um, there's not enough of it. We're not permitting enough mines. Um, NIMBYism in the Western world is an extraordinarily powerful phenomenon. And um, in the developing world, governments are rightly saying, wait a minute, um, where's my, you know, how, how can I wet my beak a little more to steal a Godfather reference? And so this export, you know, controversy in Panama is all about who's sharing the value. And they, they rightly should get a, a share of the value. Look, we have decided to outsource the ugly aspects of what needs to be done to execute the so-called green transition. Um, there are costs for doing that. Look, the, the benefit is you don't have to look at an ugly mine uh, in your beautiful you know, ski resort in Maine, like we talked about with this lithium deposit um, back in December. Um, yeah, I believe that piece was called Transition to Nowhere. Um, ultimately, that which can't go on forever usually doesn't. There is not enough copper to execute the electrification of everything. And um, we will soon realize that. And when we do, we'll have to shift course. Um, unlike the yen, or unlike the Fed, um, copper's real. Copper's needed. Copper has other uses um, that are very valuable for society. And so if we artificially increase the demand in some fruitless endeavor, to electrify everything, um, there will be consequences and recourses, and the market will dictate it. You know, there is not a central bank of copper that can just flood the market with liquidity. Um, when we run out of copper, we're out of copper. You can't print it. Um, and so, in this case, unlike with the yen or unlike with the Fed, reality must and will be confronted. There's not enough of it. It doesn't mean necessarily it's bullish because once people realize we're just not going to go through with this, it could collapse the future demand, you know, curves that are propping up the price today. But there's not enough of it, we can't print it, and no amount of hand-waving or S-curves or exponential growth is going to uh, fix that. Well, speaking of things we can't print, I want to get your views on oil at the moment, because last time you were on, you mentioned humanity will be needing fossil fuels out into the foreseeable future, and yet we've had years of underinvestment in exploration 
and development of new oil reserves. Um, so could this cause a lack of supply to meet continued demand and cause greater price inflation for your average person? Because energy is life, as you like to say, and, and the inputs of energy go into everything. So that gets passed on into the price of pretty much everything. Or do you think eventually a time will come where the old adage of higher price, high prices curing high prices will come to pass despite all of these ESG mandates and concerns? I mean, we, we have just seen the Biden administration approve a ConocoPhillips $8 billion willow oil field in Alaska. So maybe that's a step forward in the right direction. But how do you see oil positioned at the moment? Uh, we're still bullish oil in any sort of um, scenario where, you know, Monte Carlo simulation where the world doesn't fall apart, um, China reopening. We have, you can look at the numbers. We have not seen the traditional response to elevated commodity prices vis-a-vis -vis investment in new development like we have seen historically. It's just fact. And um, despite natural gas collapsing and coal coming off its highs by a factor of 60% and change, oil is still at $75 a barrel. And at $75 a barrel, um, without overinvestment, everybody in the oil sector is printing cash. You just saw record earnings from Saudi Arabia today, which I'm sure, or recently, which I'm sure you saw. Um, and I would say I would keep a close eye on uh, what China is doing geopolitically and diplomatically. You know, this, this deal that they cut between Saudi Arabia and Iran, I think, is very profound actually could impact the price of gold for reasons I'm sure you understand. Um, and um, it's worth keeping an eye on. Uh, China, while we are, um, you know, facing the world with uh, animosity, um, China is is quietly, let's, let's never underestimate our geopolitical opponents. I think it was a striking photo op to see the leaders of China sitting in the middle of senior leaders from Saudi Arabia and Iran cutting a basically a, a detente between those warring factions uh, in the Middle East. And that's pretty profound. And it, get, it gets no play in the Western media. But you can bet that that is being spun hard in China, Iran, and Saudi Arabia. And a unified Middle East partnered with, with China. Because don't forget, you know, I think Zolt Zoltan put out a, a really fascinating piece on commodity encumbrance. You know, prices and commodities, as we talked about with natural gas, are set at the margins. And if the incremental free float of oil and other energy sources like coal. We put out a piece called the Streisand Effect on Coal, where we made the call that the demand for coal is only going to rise for decades to come. Um, if the, the marginal swing capacity of oil is directed towards Asia with long-term contracts, that leaves far more buyers to fight over far fewer barrels, which could really lead to sustained elevated prices. And, and traditionally, this would be about the time where because oil spiked over 100 last year, that all kinds of incremental supply would be coming on stream and we would get a glut. We haven't seen that. Worse still is the performance in the shale patch. And the, you know, those, those wells are different than the rest of the world. They tend to have bursts of productivity followed by very quick decay rates. And so we shall see. Um, we are structurally bullish oil. Um, and we are bullish the demand for coal long term, although I think we are seeing a lot of investment in coal in the developing world, like Indonesia and so on, um, where we should, we prices are sort of more fairly balanced now versus where they were. Um, but yeah, for sure, we, we are bullish oil in a world where the economy doesn't collapse. In a world where the economy collapses, you could quickly see negative oil again, like we saw with COVID. Right. Now, my final question is a bit of a selfish one, because this is something I've been seeing pop up here and there. And I was thinking to myself, I have to get Doomberg's take on this because you're always so level-headed and rational and never with any hyperbole. So I want to get your thoughts on the WHO pandemic accord. You know, people are saying this would give the WHO pretty sweeping powers to direct governments who signed on to follow certain procedures in the case of something they declare a pandemic occurring. It's set to come into effect in 2024. And on the extreme side, people are concerned this is going to be used as a tool of control to lock, lock people down, limit their movements, remove bodily autonomy, force vaccines and other medical treatments on people. Is this just, you know, more making a mountain out of a molehill sort of behavior here? Or is there some actual validity to people's concerns about this accord in your view? Um, I would say both. I wouldn't get too worked up about it. I'll tell you a story, Jesse. Um, I live in a state 
look, I'm like everybody. When the lockdowns came and I was watching the videos of people collapsing in China and I have children and family to care for, I went into turtle mode and prep mode. And, you know, I'm very blessed to have, um, you know, a life where I could do most of my productive work from home. And, and, um, and I, you know, when the vaccines were first announced, I, I believed the propaganda and I got, you know, fully vaccinated. Um, I didn't get boosted. And I think I'm, I'm not in a, in a minority. I think a lot of people had some hesitations after they actually saw the data and, and fool me once kind of mindset. But having said that, here was a life-changing moment for me. My good friend, Tony Greer, who runs TG Macro, a great daily trading newsletter, highly endorse it. He and I were both speaking, you know, uh, he and the Doomberg team were both speaking at a a conference in, in Nashville at the beginning of 2022. And we were still in lockdown mode in the state that I lived in and people were still wearing masks and so on and so on. And I went to Nashville and after the conference, we all went to um, this Kid Rock's uh, honky tonk bar there in Nashville, which is an amazing time, right? And so I go into this bar and nobody's wearing a mask. The place is packed. It's a party, people are hugging drinking beers, I'm giving Tony a hug, you know, um, listening to music, living. That was the first time I had lived, viscerally, since the COVID lockdowns, okay? And now, contrasting that, we get on the flight home, and we're sitting there, pre-flight cocktail, and pretending to take our mask off to drink, and there's a passenger in the rear of the plane that won't cover his nose with his mask. And they turn the plane around and they kick this guy and his, um, presumably his girlfriend, off the plane before we go take off. And the, I had literally just the night before been in a bar with 2,000 people who were Americans living their lives. And then the government bureaucracy of these crazy mask mandates on planes. And I, I had a realization, which is, when presented with these two choices, America is going to choose Kid Rock's honky tonk bar. <laughs> they just are. And I don't, I can't imagine a world where some WHO accord is going to cause the people of Nashville to not go to Kid Rock's bar on a Friday night and live. And as crazy as that story sounds, it was profound for me. And I started living after that. There's a whole part of the country that didn't stop living. I did. My part of the country did. I regret it. Never again. So if something from this crazy WHO accord shows up, it's not going to do it. Arrest me. Right. It's that simple. I like that. Yes. And, and in, in the area where I live, in, in the Balkans, in Europe, we definitely will not comply in that, in that case either. So I, I definitely get your point there. Well, thank you so much for joining us today, Doomberg. For those who want to hear more from you, maybe could you fill us in on some more details about your Substack and anywhere else you'd like to direct people online? Yeah, we'd love to direct people predominantly to our Substack, doomberg.substack.com. We are 100% subscriber supported. We do not take ads. We do not accept sponsorships. There's nothing wrong with those business models. But for us, um, being listener supported or, or reader supported gives us the editorial freedom to be as provocative as we would like to be, as we feel like we need to be, to be our authentic selves. And um, it's the work of our lives. We are the number one finance Substack in the world, something that we are forever proud of having achieved. And uh, when, when somebody knocks us off of that mantle, we, we, we will be the first to congratulate them. But it, it's truly the work of our lives. It's, it's where we publish. We publish six to eight pieces a month. And you will get the unvarnished views of the Doomberg team on energy finance and the economy at large. And um, really uh, appreciated the conversation, Jesse, and looking forward to coming back soon. Yeah, awesome. I'll put a link to the Substack in the description below and definitely look forward to continuing the conversation. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Commodity Culture is a series on commodities and natural resources. If you would like to see more, be sure to subscribe and hit the bell notification so you're always up to date with the latest episodes.